So you would encourage folks in your church, you would encourage any Christian, I guess, to get involved in Earth Day to some extent, maybe picking up trash or whatever the festivities might be? Earth Day began from a speech by a senator from Wisconsin. He was actually speaking at the time in Seattle, not in Wisconsin. It was in uh, 1969, and he said, the next April 22, we need to have uh, Earth Day. And, of course, campuses were already brimming with the idea anyway, but he sort of uh, tapped into what was there under the surface. And so it really went quite national, April the 22nd, 1970. The Earth Day movement adopted in the passage of time from the influence of a young girl a flag. And that flag is, as you might expect, mainly green. The flag is not widely known to most people, but it has a symbol. That very symbol on the Earth Day flag is a symbol that's used for the word God. That, in my opinion, gives an incredible opportunity as you work alongside someone on Earth Day to point to the flag and say, look at that. Do you know why that Greek letter's there? And I can tell you there's a 90-plus percent chance they're going to say, no, I don't. Well, let me tell you why I think it's there. Because God created this world. In the same way he loves his world, and why we're out here picking up trash, in that same way, guess what? Our God wants to know all of us. Do, do you know him? And it gives an evangelistic window. It's very similar when Paul arrived at Mars Hill and says, you know this, this big marker to an unknown God? Let me tell you who that God is. To me, the earth flag, it really gives us an opportunity to do exactly that. It should be the church that's taking the lead in caring for the environment and not someone who may worship in a pagan sense that environment. Absolutely, because in a pagan world, their view of the afterlife has so many limitations, depending upon what group we're speaking of. In contrast to that, we as believers see the earth as having a very critical role in the future, a new heaven and a new earth. It doesn't say the earth is trashed. It says God somehow renews it. He makes it new. Some contend that the new heaven and new earth aren't two separate entities, that New heaven and new earth is one and the same thing. In other words, heaven is here upon a fully regained paradise. Paradise was lost through the rebellion of Lucifer, who became Satan, and paradise was lost through the sins of Adam and Eve. As a result, we're waiting in this dysfunctional time when there's heartache, suffering, sickness, disease, and death. We're waiting for that full reclaiming or reclamation project of the earth to take place, a new heaven, a new earth, where paradise is regained from what paradise once was. That being the case, the final redemption of all society is very critical. And the word salvation does not mean just the saving of my individual spirit or my individual soul. The word salvation, properly understood scripturally, means the restoring of all that was lost. Romans 8, for example, Romans 8, 21, in one of the translations says that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. See, we're in a world that's decaying. Atrification. Every one of us, every second that goes by, we're older and there's a decay process taking place. But even the creation itself wants to be liberated from that, the bondage of decay. And then it goes on verse 22. This is Romans 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In other words, we have a genetic predisposition to long for that which is eternal. We don't want things to last a short time. Because God is stamped on our heart. The image of God is stamped upon us. We want things that are forever. There's a forever longing within us. That's why we have a tug and a longing for heaven. Because we know it's, it doesn't end in just this earth in a short time and a death. And we also have stamped on our heart a longing for perfection. We're made in the eyes of one who saw things perfectly. And we have a longing for things to be done perfectly. We, we don't like ourselves when we do things sloppily when we can do it better. Well, we don't have eternality here, and we don't have perfection here. That's yet to come. And all of creation understands that too, and is groaning, as in a woman giving birth to a child, it says, groaning for this grand day of full restoration. So we, as Bible-believing Christians, should care way more about the environment because the earth fits into our eschatology, our doctrine of the end times, in a very profound, a, a breathtaking way. This is very significant to us. As a listener, Jim, you certainly have piqued my interest, but now what do I do? What would you say to the person who's not sure how to get involved or what to do? Uh, What would you suggest in a very practical way? 
Well, one thing is, is find ways not to harm the environment. I don't think we have to be geeks or nerd or weirdo or wackos on this issue. I think we have to be prudent and wise and look for every way, given the dynamics of the life as we have to live it, how do, can we take the maximum steps to be non-harmful to the environment which we find ourselves. A second thing is encourage others to good environmental stewardship. We, we don't have to apologize as Bible-believing Christians for encouraging others to take steps that treat our earth with great respect. And in the life of the church, and whatever church people are in, encourage us to be discussed. This is not, quote, a liberal topic. It's not a liberal agenda. I preached on this in my church not too long ago, and a lady in my church who has a background in Christianity for her whole life said to me, when I heard you were going to be speaking on this, frankly, I dreaded it. I thought, oh, no. But I could not believe how exciting the topic was. And I walked through passage after passage. I took up Psalm 104, Job 38, passage after passage. We read more scripture that day than I had done almost in any weekend service. And so it caused people to realize this is a biblical issue. And then advocate and try to champion the cause of, of, of reasonable policies. At the same time, and this is where it gets very exciting, communicate to those that you're involved with why you're doing it. That you're not doing it just out of love for the earth, though you have love for the earth. You're doing it out of a motivation, deep passion for God who made this earth, your heavenly father. That it's not, quote, mother earth. That's impersonal. It's father God. And then, <laughs> every way you can, use it as an opportunity to try to introduce people to this creator God. I think it'd be exciting to talk to people about what happened Christmas Eve, 1968, as Apollo 8 circled the moon, and for the first time ever, humankind saw, this is not the lunar landing, this was just the circling of the moon, three astronauts, and they, for the first time, saw what human eyes never seen before, and that was an Earth rise. And as those three astronauts watched our spectacular Earth rise over the lunar surface, an Earth rise, they then read live, it was beamed back, and we stood by our television sets, with an image of the earth, and we heard those three astronauts take turn reading Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the earth. We need to reclaim what that moment represented. We need to even talk to people about what happened that night and how spectacular it was as people begin to realize how wonderful our earth was because God made it. This has been the Garlo Perspective with Reclaiming Earth Day, one in a series of specials with Dr. Jim Garlo, brought to you by the Garlo Perspective at garloperspective.com.